Hey there, welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 555. And today we're going to talk about why everyone should consider tournaments. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm joined by Andrew Adams. And we're here on this show to talk about traditional martial arts. Why? Because everything we do at Whistlekick is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to see everything we do, all the things that we've got going on, check out whistlekick.com. That's our online home. It's the place to find our store. And if you find something in there that catches your eye, use the code podcast15 to save yourself 15%. Now, if you want to check out stuff for this show specifically, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's the place to go. That's where you're going to find every episode that we do. We put out two a week, and it's all with the goal of connecting, educating, and entertaining the traditional martial artists of the world. If you want to contribute to that work, you can do a number of things. You could make a purchase. Like I said, you could share an episode. You could follow us on social media. Tell a friend what we've got going on. Pick up one of our books on Amazon. Leave a review on podcast platform or Google or Facebook or somewhere else that I didn't think of. Or support the Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. It's a place where we post exclusive content. And if you contribute as little as $2 a month, you're going to get access to some of it. The more you're willing to contribute, the more we're going to give you access to. So... Tournaments, competitions, it's a divisive topic. It's one that gets some people really excited and others really mad. And Andrew, this was your idea to talk about. So I, I want to give you the opportunity to intro it. Yeah, you know, thanks. Why you wanted to talk about it. Yeah, well, so tournaments are things that happen. Whether you do or don't like them, they're going to happen. And they happen all over the world. And I have been at schools whose main purpose, or I haven't been at them as a student, but I've been to schools where their main focus was competitions. And they might do mm, 15 to 20 tournaments a year. And then I have been at schools that don't do any at all, ever. Uh, and I have had instructors who were against tournaments for various reasons, and I have had instructors who were neutral on the subject. So I think there's a wide range of things to discuss in this, but I think there's a lot of good reasons to consider doing tournaments as long as you understand some of the negatives that may happen as well. Mm. And when you say do tournaments, you're talking about attending tournaments, not necessarily hosting or promoting tournaments, right? Yeah, that's correct. I'm, I'm talking about the school going as a school to a tournament to compete. Yeah. And we talked about this subject a little bit back, way back on 52. But you brought up that in listening to that one, you know, we really talked about it. I talked about it more from the side of promotion and hosting because it was right around the time we were getting ready to host a tournament. The first the first and only whistle kick tournament. So if you want to go back and see that. That episode was a great episode to talk about what make what could make a tournament a good tournament, but that's not what I think we'll be discussing here. No, and I, and I like the title that we have: "Why Everyone Everyone Should Consider." Right, so we're talking about everybody who is training, but we're not saying everybody has to compete. We're not saying that it's a good thing for everybody, but I think everybody, and I, I agree, this everybody needs to understand the up and downside to competition and if it lines up with your values as a martial artist. Absolutely. Yeah. When I was growing up, we, I, I wasn't in a tournament school by any means. I mean, I, I, I think my time in competition probably exceeded the time in competition for the rest of the school combined, except maybe the instructors. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was, I competed heavily and we had a number of people who would, you know, go once or something. And that was actually at the instructor's recommendation. They, they said, you know, look, there's something to be gained in competition and you don't really know if it's for you unless you try it. So give it a whirl and see what you think. And that was really the, the theme of a lot of what we did in, in that karate school that I was raised in that, you know, let's, let's give it a whirl. Let's see what happens. You know, how about you? What was your kind of introduction to competition? When I was in high school, the the traditional dojo that I trained at uh, decided to become uh, members of the a uh, had all the kids become members of the AAU, uh, the Amateur Athletic Union, and we ended up going to 
four, maybe three or four tournaments that year. Um, it was not mandatory for students to go to the tournaments. It, it wasn't a required thing, but it was it was definitely advertised as something that was available. Um, and so I did a handful of tournaments, high school age, 15, 16, 17, somewhere around in there. Um, and then uh, I probably didn't attend another tournament until uh, – not probably. I didn't attend another tournament until I was a black belt. Wow. And what did you Many- think of those early days? Um, I, I enjoyed it. I'm one that really, I don't want to say excels in tournaments. I don't mean I do well, but I do well with pressure and stress Mm. and I enjoy competition regardless of whether it's martial arts or, uh, you know, for for those, many of you out there may know that I do uh, music as well. And I compete in a, in a organization within my music as well. And I enjoy competition so for me i i I liked it i i got a lot out of it Hmm. yeah i could see that i'm very similar in that i i like the pressure i like the platform of competition um martial arts competition is probably the the it was the first place where i felt special Mm -hmm. and that came not just because i started doing well but because it was a rare time where everyone was paying attention to me. And I liked sure. that. I liked that feeling of, of being the center of everyone's focus, at least for a little while. And and you brought up a great word, which is pressure. There are, I, I had an instructor who said there are three times when you're truly pressure tested. One is a tournament that you are put under the gun and put under the wire and you've got to perform in front of people. The second would be testing. You're definitely put under the pressure when you're going for your next rank. And the third is an actual uh, altercation somewhere out in the real world. Right. So uh, pressure testing is, is definitely a a pro in my opinion for tournaments. It, It, you get to see how well you do in a situation where you have to perform and not have to worry about, that it, you know, if you're on the street and you're being pressure tested, well, something could really go wrong. Well, <laughs> nothing's really going to go wrong at a tournament. You might not perform well, but that's also not the end of the world. I would say there is no safer way to inoculate yourself against the anxiety of performing martial arts in front of people when it matters than doing forms in a competition. Absolutely. When you talk to Anybody who teaches self-defense and combatives, you know, not just martial arts, but, you know, higher level stuff where the likelihood of utilizing those skills is is much greater. They talk about the need to perform under that pressure. And I think we can all agree that, you know, we might do great in training, but when you've got to use it, you know, someone tries to mug you or whatever, your use of those skills is going to have a, a strong correlation with your ability to handle the stress of that situation. So training under those stressful situations, you can only take that so far in your own space. You get used to the people, you get used to the the environment, you go to competition and it's different. And it's like you said, it's one of three times. And I think it's so valuable in that respect. I can stand up in front of crowds, massive crowds and give presentations because of my time performing forms and sparring in front of a bunch of people. Absolutely. It's a matter of stepping outside of your comfort zone and making your comfort zone bigger. And then you step outside of your comfort zone a little bit more and make it even bigger. And then things can become much much easier to do. Now, I say the word can because some people's anxiety is such that it would not be beneficial for them to go. And I think that can be a con for going to tournaments that if you may have kids who have such anxiety that if it's something that is required for them to do, they might just stop altogether and leave your school. Yep. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and I'm not a big fan of mandating competition. Um, I think there are ways that you can achieve that stress level if that's important. You know, it, it could be um, setting up a mock competition environment in the school. You know, you, you could, you could do a lot of things like that that are lower key because every everybody's got a level that they're able to perform at 
right? If, if the person's showing up to class, they have a level that you can work with. And so you just need to find a, what's, a, what's a little bit more. You know, and that's that iterative progress of martial arts that we do inherently with everything else that we do, just from one to the next to the next. And you get a little bit better and you can apply that with pressure as well. Sure. But it, it requires an instructor who's willing to mm. not I don't want I don't want to say willing, because I, I think everyone would be willing, but that is able to see yeah. and recognize students who might become too anxious. Yep. And recognize that other other students in the school might not realize because because not, not that all participants at tournaments are kids, but um, I think a vast majority would be. Would you agree? Yeah. The, the At any of the competitions I've been at across multiple circuits, ch under 18 children have certainly made up the majority of competitors. And and so if that's the case, I think it's also important to recognize that let's say it, going to this particular tournament is not mandated but you have a large number of kids who are going they and you have a student who has such anxiety that doesn't want to try it or doesn't want to go recognizing that other students may inadvertently pressure that student to go and that could also be a downside mm, for sure what else what are some of the other i, I bet you got a list in front of you I, of course I do. I'm a list. I'm a list guy. I'm a list guy too, but I didn't have to be a list guy because you're the list guy. I let you be the list guy. <laughs> Who's your topic? What what uh, what's the next one? So pressure testing was number one. Number two, sportsmanship and mm. and understanding that it's okay to lose and how to be a good winner. Now I bet people listening are saying, yeah, but you know everybody deals with that. Everybody knows. Nope. <laughs> nope, not not even a little. Look at our society today. Yep. People cannot handle losing or be not being the best or being, heaven forbid, wrong at, with something. Right. And we're we're facing a lot of problems in society right now with that. Now, I'm not going to pretend that we're suddenly going to get a bunch of adults to join martial arts and go to competition and that they will, you know, in a short period of time become more sportsmanlike, but we still have children. You know, maybe we have to skip this generation and go on to the next. Mm -hmm. So I think that that can't be overlooked. You, the the ability to learn that, which leads into the next couple of topics, which is teamwork and friendship. Mm -hmm. Teamwork being, if you're going as a school, you're going as an organization, and you're working together. You might not necessarily be directly working together unless you're doing a like a team kata or something um but learning how to work as a group and supporting each other is also a very important skill i think for kids to learn yeah it, it, it's important for everybody to learn and one of the things that i've noticed you know you talked about the distinction between schools that really embrace competition and those that don't the ones that embrace competition I, i'm i'm going to be I'm going, to, I'm going to make a statement that may not appeal to everyone. The schools that embrace competition, in my experience, have higher quality students. Overall, it does not mean that there aren't exceptions. I, I, I do not describe the school that I went to as embracing competition. And I would like to think that I did well as a competitor and that I am a competent martial artist. But here's why I make that statement. The whole point of going to competition is to get better, right? You go, you perform, you have a result, you hopefully go back to the drawing board and find how you can improve. Well, the more people you have going back to the drawing board, the more you're going to see people picking up ideas from each other. Uh, they create a culture. Uh, maybe there are additional classes. And maybe you reject that concept in martial arts. I don't mean you, Andrew, but maybe a listener. <laughs> but if you take a look at every sport, every athletic endeavor, does that not tend to happen? Football has training camps. The Olympics brings people together, not just from the same sports, but from a bunch of sports. And they train in the same environment. You're creating an environment that has expectations. And those expectations are established by the group, by the culture. And once you become part of that culture, you tend to go along for the ride. 
Yeah, I, I would I would agree. Absolutely. The the last thing which kind of ties into what you were just talking about is students become exposed to different mm. martial arts. And and because you're likely not I mean not that this doesn't happen, there are tournaments like this, but uh, most tournaments are not only open to one style. Uh, again, I know there are some that are that are yep. like that, yep, but most are. of most of them are are open tournaments. So if you are a uh, a Shotokan school, you're gonna go to this tournament and see Taekwondo forms, or see uh, some Kung Fu forms, or right. uh, other styles of martial art that you haven't had exposure to, which can help you as well grow as an individual within your learning. And I think having a discussion after a tournament with your students as to what they saw can lead to some really great teaching and learning moments. I agree. Absolutely. By getting out of the environment that you are used to, you're going to see a lot of different things. I made friends on the competition circuit. I learned refinements to my existing techniques. I learned new techniques. I learned forms. I met people who I went to train with the, the, one of the reasons that I went to college in Central Mass was because there was a martial arts school I wanted to attend. You know, it wasn't the main reason, but it was definitely a factor. Oh, and if I go here, I could train there. Mm -hmm. So by getting that exposure to more and different, you start to see how big and broad the world of martial arts is. And for most of us, when we train in our school, we're in a whether we want to realize it or not, we're in a pretty small group. You know, most martial arts classes don't have more than, you know, a couple dozen people in them at a time. And we're working with one perspective on what martial arts is. And if you don't know how many different perspectives there are, sometimes conflicting, it can be really easy to think, oh, well, this is just how it's done. I've seen that. I've, I've actually lived that. I've been to other schools and thought, I didn't even know this was a thing. I didn't even know that you could do it that way. I didn't know that a class could run in this different way. And the more you're exposed to, the more you determine what you like, what works for you, what doesn't. And if you go on to teach someday, you get to incorporate those ideas. And that all starts from exposure. And there's no better place for exposure than competition. Yep. Yeah, I would agree. So that goes through my list of pros. But okay. I think I think uh, this discussion wouldn't be complete without discussing some of the the things that may turn people off to competition and and explain why some schools have chosen not to because maybe they they put more stock in what we're about to discuss, which might be some of the the things that are are not as as good. Yeah, yeah. Let's. What do you, what do you got first? So the one that I always hear, and, and this isn't me necessarily thinking this is true, but this is a an argument that I hear often, which is that for in regards to sparring, that it teaches students how to pull their punches and not actually, it, and I'm putting this in air quotes, effectively do a technique. Um, I remember hearing stories of, um, and I've been in traditional dojos where once you do a technique and you, let's say you, you flip someone uh, doing a judo throw of some such, you are not allowed to hold your hand out and help the student up because it teaches you're, you're helping your enemy. And, you know, that I don't know how true this story is, but I've heard it from multiple different instructors that there was once someone who was uh, confronted on the street by someone with a knife and did the technique, you know, the person tried to mug him and the martial artist uh, effectively disarmed his uh, attacker. And then when he was done, threw the knife down on the ground next to the person that was attacking him because that's what he was used to in the dojo. So the argument there is that going to tournaments where you're not necessarily punching full force uh, at an opponent teaches you to not be effective. That's the argument that I have heard. And I, I can hear in your voice that you you don't fully agree with that. And uh, I'm going to, I'm going to call big old BS on that argument. And here's why. If let, let's, let's say, let's say that's true. Let's say there's a school and they don't attend tournaments because sparring and utilizing less than full force is conditioning them to not perform as well 
if the need arises. Is that is that a, a that's a good summation of the argument? Yep. Yeah. Okay. I would, yep. All right. Um, how are they training? <laughs> exactly. If if you if you're not if if pulling your punches in competition is training you poorly, then that only leaves two possibilities in training. You're not making you're not doing anything that approaches sparring. Thus, you're not training any kind of uh, focus at any range, right? You're you're not working with people in that way, or even worse. You're going full force among all your training partners all the time, and breaking people, and and that that's not going to work either. Here's how I see it: Does point sparring, any kind of competition sparring, is that directly applicable to street confrontations? No. Does it train some of the things that are necessary for a street confrontation? Yes. Timing. Distance, balance. All, all the things that are, are are appropriate. Now, here's the thing. It is not, and, and let's be honest, if the only way you know how to determine the range of a technique you should throw is based on, let me say it a different way. If I go to... Competitions, and I'm constantly coming really, really close to that person that I'm sparring. And let's say I'm I'm excelling and I'm winning and I'm getting close, and maybe I'm just barely making contact. You know, not not anything that would harm anyone. Are you saying for a moment that that my ability to judge that range with that person moving? Because remember, they're not just standing still waiting for me to hit them. It's not a heavy bag. Yep. My ability to do that will not translate into making contact. The person's in a different place each time. I have to adjust my range. I have to adjust the point that I'm focusing on. Now, yeah, I do need the ability to take that further. I need to be able to rotate my hips that much more or reach out with my foot that much, whatever the technique is. Is it a a slightly different skill set and, more importantly, mindset? Absolutely. But what's the alternative? Everyone's broken or you never train with partners? Yeah, I, I, I'm not a huge fan of this argument either. Um, having said that, I do understand the not helping people up in the dojo, but that's something also totally separate. There are times when it's appropriate and times when it's not. Exactly. I'm not a big fan of sweeping generalizations. When I, let's say, let, let's take that example of some kind of grappling scenario and whether or not to put my hand out if i'm working with someone in the school and i'm throwing them down and they're gifting me their body to work on and we're doing you know more than two i'm absolutely going to help them up because i want them to help me up because then combined we can put more reps in we can get better at the part that's important but let's say i'm working with that same person doing that same exchange in a demonstration if I'm trying to make it really um, dramatic, maybe I won't. Mm-hmm. If it's a grappling competition, I'm not going to help them up until the quote unquote combative time is over. I have seen, so here's a great example. Most of the competitions I go to are point sparring based on, on the, the sparring side. And you'll see people who are going incredibly hard. I mean, there's, there's a lot of intensity and, and let's be honest, most high level point sparring tournaments have far more contact than even the rules permit. And so people saying that, you know, it's, it's, it's fluffy are probably not paying attention, but the moment that point is called or the, or the match is stopped quite a few, especially the best fighters will help each other up. They'll give each other a high five. Hey, that was a good point. They're Mm -hmm. trying to get the best out of each other. And if you want the best example of this, no, this wasn't point sparring, but it was competition. Bill Wallace and Joe Lewis fighting, what was that, 1990, 91? They were best friends. I don't mean Mm -hmm. they kind of knew each other. I mean, they they were literally best friends and they had an exhibition match. And the moment that fight started, they were beating the tar out of each other. And the moment that fight stopped, they were best friends again. Yep. And there's that sportsmanship. Yes. The two can coexist. What else? 
Um, I've also heard the argument, and and I, I've seen this personally, that it can teach students to be driven by a thing, mm. by uh, by getting the trophy or getting the medal, and that's why they do it, as opposed to, uh, at least in traditional schools, doing it for growth of the person. And I have seen that. It it can happen. And you know when it stops happening? After about the first dozen trophies. Yep. Ask a kid, hey, you know, let's, let's well, I'll speak from my personal experience because that's what I know best. When I started competing and I earned a trophy, it was like, hey, yay, this is cool. I won a trophy. And then I remember a couple years later, driving back from Hartford, Connecticut, with my arms over two trophies that were five and a half feet tall while the person I was, uh, I went to the tournament with, she had one as well. So there were four of us and these taller than me at the time, not that I'm much taller now, uh, trophies in a, a Dodge caravan driving back three and a half, four hours. That wasn't fun. I didn't want those trophies. We talked about leaving them there. <laughs> They're still in my mother's basement. Now, why, why do I bring up that example? Because at some point for everyone, the physical manifestation of that success is no longer the important thing. You figure it out. We tend to normalize the things that we have, right? And even little kids, you give them a trophy every weekend because they you know, kick some butt, they win. Eventually, that trophy is not going to mean too much. So what does? And that's where it becomes special and different. Different people are motivated by different things. I... I've done an episode on uh, participation awards. Um, I should look up what episode that is and how wrong those are. But the mis- if, if finding motivation in some kind of external reward is wrong, then belts are wrong. Uh, promotions at work are wrong in, in some cases. There, there's a lot that is very similar to giving someone an award. Yep, I see that side. I, I totally agree with that. And if you disagree with any of this stuff, by all means, I, w- I want you to... I oh, you know me so. well enough to know I that do, I will. I do. I want the I have... listeners to know that that I'm not uh, stifling you. No, I, I don't feel stifled. You, you don't uh, cue me on things to and not to say. <laughs> <laughs> so the last the last topic that I had in regards to the, the cons, and I will admit that I don't know that I have enough experience to see whether this has or hasn't happened, but I have to imagine it has. But I've heard a lot of people say that politically there have been issues where one school is not treated as well as another school be for various different reasons. And I I, I would be surprised that that doesn't happen. So I have to imagine that it does. Oh, it absolutely happens. And so that can be a, a, a downside. The, the instructor may say, you know what, we're not going to go to tournaments because they're, quote, not fair um, because X, Y, Z. You know, we, we our students will not be judged fairly going to the tournament. And so we're just going to allow all of our students to not do well. And that's not going to be good for our students. So let's not go. And so here's my response to that. Yes, it happens. Yes, that is true. Yes, that is a very compelling reason to not bring people to competition. But is that attitude a good philosophy for life? And I would suggest it's not. Most of us have had an employer or a coworker that didn't treat us fairly. We've had some kind of circumstance, maybe a, a teacher or a professor who didn't like our work. My writing was absolutely hated in high school and college. And let me say, I am the only person who went on out of my high school group when my teachers would continually give me terrible feedback on my writing. I went on to be a managing editor for an online publication, one that served um, an IT company that makes computers. And statistically, you all have one of them or have. Let's let's say that they're that big. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um Just because someone doesn't like you, your school, your form, your style, doesn't mean that you can't get all of the other benefits that we've talked about today. Pressure still applies. It even applies more. I had had somebody once score me down on a form, and they told me, they were very open about this. They didn't even do that form. 
or the style that I grew up with that that form came from. But because they once remembered seeing a video of the Styles founder doing that form and his memory of it was different than what I did, he scored me down. Oh, my goodness. Like, it, it's it's wrong in about three ways. This was an open competition that wasn't supposed to play in. But so what? Okay. So next time I, I competed, I made sure that I was that much better. You, you've mm-hmm. got to make it so compelling that they can't help but call your point or score your form highly. It's very subjective, which is what makes this so incredible, uh, which makes it so difficult for some students to wrap their heads around when they don't do well. It's it's subjective. It's, you know, that yes, there are some things that the judges can be looking for to to level the playing field, but it, it's definitely subjective. I, I, when I was in my late 30s, I went to a tournament. It's the first one I'd been to in many years. And I did a um, a sigh form that I had just taken. I just taken an empty hand form, gave myself a pair of sigh, and said, "How would I do this?" And I went to the tournament, and in that particular event, I took second. And the person that took first and third, there were only three of us. It was a very small contest, but they both did very flashy, spinny. Um, extreme martial arts style bow forms. And after it was all over and I got second, the uh, head judge came up to me afterwards privately and said, you know, I know you only got second, but I want you to know that you were the only one that knew how to actually fight with those weapons, <laughs> which I thought was interesting. But, it, you know, it, it goes to show that that's another side that people don't may not understand that why they're not doing as well. Right. Right. And, Absolutely. I, I I don't have anything to add. Which leads to my very last one. Actually, I, I thought that was my last one, but I, I, I lied. <laughs> Good. Um, s- s- there are many schools out there that don't do Kobudo or don't, don't do any weapons stuff. Yep. Uh, and that's fine. Every, every school needs to decide what's best for them. But if s- there are schools that don't do weapons, they may start to feel obligated and pressured by students to start doing them so they have something else to do at tournaments. And I suppose that that could be true. Um, I think my, my counter to that is if you go to competitions, you'll see that the weapons divisions are smaller. They, you know, you might have a hundred people across an, an age and rank group doing empty hand forms and maybe five to 10 of them will do weapons. Yeah. So it's if not, anything, definitely not as big. Yeah, if anything, it's an argument against it, just based on the, the numbers. Uh, sure. And more generally, let, let's say, let's say your students come back, and they want more with regard to competition. If you can't deliver that, that that's the exact sort of reason why I um, I advocate for cross training, or at least the option of cross training. Mm-hmm. You can't provide everything to everyone. It just no no one person can do that, whether you're a martial arts instructor or something else. It doesn't work that way. I think that's a lot. That's a, a, a good summary of the, the pros and the cons. For, for yeah, we got into the weeds quite a bit. Yeah. And well, I like I like that we do. And that's that's why you're here to help me get into the weeds and come back. We don't want the canoe stranded. <laughs> if anybody spent time in a canoe, you know what I mean? I'm more of a kayak guy myself. Mm, same idea, though. You can get the kayak stranded, too. Yep. All right. Anything we want to add before we wrap this up? No, I think that was a good episode. All right. Well, for those of you listening, uh, episode 52, episode 189. 189 is the Participation Award one. If you want to check those out, they're in your podcast app. They're at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And you know what else is over there? All the photos, all the videos, all the links and transcripts for all the episodes are there. And if you're up for supporting us and everything that we've got going, you've got a lot of options. You can make a purchase at whistlekick.com and use the code podcast15. Or you could leave a review. You could buy a book. You could help out with our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick. If you see somebody out there wearing something with whistle kick on it, say hello. If you have feedback for us, you can find us on social media at whistle kick, or you can email me with feedback or guest suggestions or anything else. If you just want to chat, 
hit me up. Jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Have a great day. Have a great day.